My name is Darren. I'm one of the pastors. We're in a series called Practicing the Way of Jesus. We're looking at uh, reframing our church over the next long season around becoming disciples or apprentices of Jesus. And the goal of the, uh, uh, the three goals associated to being an apprentice of Jesus we've been framing. The first one is to be with Jesus. The second one is to become like Jesus. And the third is to do what Jesus did. And so uh, we're kind of doing an overview of those three. And then over the next year, we're going to kind of break them down. So today I'm going to do an overview, which I was supposed to do last week, but we, we had the power outage and we decided to do something else, which did you guys enjoy last week? I, I, I thought last week was amazing. Um, but today we're going to talk about uh, what it means to become like Jesus. So um, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has this famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, where it kinda, it's a collection of his teachings. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he begins with this announcement, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, um, and he goes off. And, and those are not conditions of blessedness. They are, in fact, um, uh, a, a kind of an, a turning uh, the world upside down on what is seen as blessed by God. And in our context, it would be the same. We would say God's blessings keep falling in our laps if you're wealthy. <laughs> For those of you, those that have ears to hear and eyes to see, <laughs> Chance the Rapper. Um, so it, it would be like those that have lots of material possessions or wealth, like we, we associate that with blessing. And Jesus says that actually, are, those are not, that's not how God does it. In fact, um, he, he just says from the beginning, um, that it's for everyone. God's favor rests on the least likely folks. So in other words, when he starts his sermon, he says it's for anyone and everyone. The burnouts, the broken, the discarded, the, the people that have no spiritual bone in their body to figure out left from right, God's favor rests on them and they're all invited in. But then he goes on. So in some ways, he lowers the bar for entrance into the kingdom. And then he raises the bar of expectation. And he says, um, if you don't have a righteousness above the Pharisees, which were like the religious elite of the day, um, you won't participate in the kingdom. And he goes on to say, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I say don't get angry inappropriately. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say uh, anyone that looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. And he goes on, don't, don't make oaths, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Don't, don't, um, don't, just, don't, re uh, don't resist an evil person. You've heard eye for an eye, but I say turn the other cheek. And then he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So in, in one like sermon, Jesus just lowers the bar for entry and raises the expectation. He says, be perfect or be holy as the heavenly father is holy. That's the expectation for us is to become the kinds of people that naturally have anger used appropriately. That raise the expectation of morality in our world. Wouldn't that be nice if the church stood on solid ground? Right? Rather than uh, condemning the world and becoming hypocrites, we, we just stand with lives that reflect the character of Christ. So be, this is what Jesus expects and of his disciples. And there's this famous passage. If you have a Bible, go to Luke chapter 6. Um, we're going to look at one very probably the shortest parable today. And then, and then today I'm just going to, it will be more of a lecture. Because today I'm going to frame um, some, a really important paradigm for us uh, and reframe spiritual formation uh, around what, what does it look like to experience transformation and how do we actually change. And I think this is so important for the future of our church, for the future of us heading into becoming more like Jesus. How do we become more like Jesus is the question I want to answer today. But Luke, in chapter 6, Jesus has this parable. In verse 39, he says this. Um, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So that's the parable. And, and in this passage, what, what is this parable about? Can you guess? Any takers? I know it's a big classroom today. Discipleship. Yes, you nailed it. It's about discipleship. Or the word 
uh, is student, right? In this, but it means disciple. It translates to disciple or apprentice, apprenticeship. So Jesus is talking about what it means to be a disciple of, uh, what it means to be a disciple. And, he, and the blind is a reference or a nod to the Pharisees. He regularly called the Pharisees blind guides. And he's saying, look, you have blind disciples following blind rabbis. And then he goes off and he says, look, a student is not above his teacher, um, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And that's the point that Jesus makes of discipleship. The point of discipleship is to become like your rabbi. And we've already made this a few weeks ago. John Mark teached about that. But for us to become like Jesus, then we need to change, don't we? Anyone want to say amen to that? And not like self-help change, like add a few things to your life, more like radical um, overhaul of your entire personhood to become like Jesus. Can I get an amen? Any, any, anyone married here? Like just, yep, that's right. My wife needs it. Um, I'm doing great. I'm just kidding. And the word for this type of change in the Bible is the word transformation. And if you have a Bible, go to 2 Corinthians 3. I just want to show you some stuff, and then we'll, we'll jump into this new paradigm. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Paul writes this. He says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, this is good, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. So this is the Greek word for the change we want to talk about. And it's the Greek word for where we get the word metamorphosis. And, and the, the dictionary describes this transformation, this metamorphosis, as the process, it's, it's similar to the process of a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. And this, for us, is what it means to become like Jesus in our lives, to be transformed. And I guess the question then is, for everyone here, is that kind of change possible? I mean, really, that type of deep change in our lives possible so that we naturally choose to respond appropriately in anger, that we choose to bless those or love our enemies, to turn the other cheek naturally without having to think about it or read about it. Is that kind of change possible? And if so, how do we do that? And let me just give you a little autobiography because this is very personal for me. Because when I was 23, my wife, my wife was 22, we started something called the Long Beach Project nine months into our marriage. We started church planning at 23 and 22 years old. No one should be doing that <laughs> at that age. Nobody should be getting married at 22 and 21. I don't know what our parents were thinking. Um, no, I'm not saying that as a statement. But, but, when you <laughs> but when you start a ministry at that young um, I was thrust into a position of leadership with no, nobody really paying attention to me um, or really checking in on some of the character flaws that I developed or the issues. Throughout the last 10 years of church planning, I, I hit a couple of roadblocks along, along the way. And I remember a few years into church planning. So we were 23. We started the Long Beach Project. We moved here at 24 and 23 and started our church right after I turned 25 and 24. Really young. So our marriage was like formed in leading a church plant. And, and that comes with all sorts of issues. It's blessing and curse. But along the way, I became anxious, really anxious. I became more insecure. I, had a, a, I developed a temper that was very quick. I always had a temper, but it was worse as I started church playing. So I'm doing the ministry of Jesus, and I'm becoming more anxious, more angry, more depressed, my marriage began to suffer along the way where I remember a fight with Alex where she was saying, I just want you to have as much energy and attention for our marriage as you do for sermons and teaching and the church. That's a red flag. Would you agree? Um, yes, and if you don't agree, well, you're living in lies and sin. Um, <laughs> that's simple. Uh, I, I became... Um, angry and, and disappointed, and I, was, uh, I became burnt out throughout the ways. Twice I became burnt out. I was obsessed with, I was a workaholic. I def I've shared all this before. I'm just bringing it back to you. Again, thanks for all the therapy. It's free here. Um, <laughs> you guys are great. Um, 
And, uh, and I began to uh, live out this false narrative of my life um, where I wanted to make everyone happy. And, and that came at a cost. It came with burnout, exhaustion. I lived and died on the approval of others. And I became obsessed um, with making everyone else happy. My marriage suffered over a long period of time. I developed a, a categories of unforgiveness that I held on to towards Alex. Um, I developed this conflict resolution pattern that had no resolution. Um, <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the other issue was because reality was hard and I had all these deep issues that weren't being resolved through prayer and reading the Bible, which we'll talk about in a second, um, I, I found it easy to escape reality. And I, I've developed habits. And that, they were very innocent at time. At, in the beginning, I developed habits of escaping through food, eating meals. So like I get depressed and angry. I, and I, I would go eat a burrito, which is not sin in itself, but it became an issue of comforting my soul through foods, through alcohol, through social media, through checking out on, online and internet, through uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, or whatever you want to call it, like streaming videos, like just allowing myself to practice escape from the things that were underneath the surface. Can anyone relate to these things? So. I'm doing ministry, preaching, leading a staff, leading a church, leading about Jesus' ministry of life, of abundance, while suffering, while, while becoming more angry and more anxious. And the problem was, I, I did, it's not that I didn't want to change. It's not that I did, like, I, I looked at my marriage and I'm like, I want it to be better. I want to be the best husband for you, Alex. I want to have a vibrant life that I could just point people to Jesus through my life. And the problem wasn't that I didn't want to change. I did want to change. The problem was I didn't know how to change. And then I realized, like, most of our church are filled with people that are well-intended or have, have good intentions, but lack the ability to make that leap of transformation. Most of us are here, and you're like, yeah, I, I totally relate to all those things, Darren. What's the deal? And, and so what I had to do is challenge um, my assumptions about my spiritual formation to Jesus and what it means to be a follower of Jesus today. So one quick uh, idea that we have to define is what is spiritual formation? See, that's the language we're going to use to describe or define what it means to become like Jesus. That phrase, it used to be sanctification. That's the same thing. It's the process of becoming holy, right? Sanctified, an image of Christ's likeness. We call it spiritual formation today. I, pre I appreciate that language versus sanctification for lots of reasons. Um, Dallas Willard defines it this way. Uh, spiritual formation in Christian tradition is the process or a process of increasingly being possessed and permeated by the character traits of Jesus as we walk in the easy yoke of discipleship with Jesus, our teacher. Does that sound amazing? That sounds awesome. But, but spiritual formation, here's the key to understanding this. Spiritual formation is not a Christian thing. It's a human thing. And this is the one thing I really wanted to, like, there's two parts to this sermon, and we're going to jump into the first part. See, humans are dynamic. We're not static. It means, it means that we're always moving, we're always changing, and we're always being formed or shaped. And to put another way, uh, you're all disciples of someone or something. The question isn't, are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? Who or what are you being shaped and formed by? And so these are the two paradigms I want to play off of to understand change and how change is possible. And anyone that's been in AA, this will sound familiar. It's just different language. Or if anyone's read Dallas Willard, it comes from Dallas Willard. But the first we're going to play off of is this idea of unintentional spiritual formation. Now pay attention to this. This is, I know it's going to be like more intellectual. It's going to be more hitting at your brain. But this is an important paradigm for us to bring practicals to in the coming weeks and months of this series. So this is such an important process for us to go through. But the first to recognize is something that we call unintentional spiritual formation. When you wake up tomorrow morning, you are being shaped in your everyday ordinary life. And here's how you are being shaped. Okay, we're going to talk through this. Okay, most of you probably in the back can't see this. We'll, we'll email the slides. We'll have it on our website. But there's, there's a triangle. Can you guys read that in the back? No, great. Okay, so... So the, the top of the triangle says stories we believe. The bottom left says relationship. The bottom right says habits. 
the middle of the triangle says environment, and then at the bottom it says over time through experiences. Now let me just break this down, this will make sense. So this is how we are shaped unintentionally. We're unintentionally shaped by the stories we believe. We all carry narratives about life and the way the world works around. Bobette Buster calls human beings narrative animals. Some of us have developed these narratives that we live with, and we've called them strongholds in the past. Like, we've grown up believing we're not good enough. And so that, that is a narrative we believe individually. And we live our lives thinking that we're not good enough. And that, sh that shapes us. It shapes our relationships. It shapes the way we interact with the world. It shapes our behaviors and thoughts. Think about if you believe in evolution with a capital E, okay? If we're just products of randomness and chance and sexuality is merely a biology or biological effects, then that view will shape your view of monogamy and marriage. That view will shape your view of sexuality and sex as a whole. Does that make sense? Or, or let's just talk about one of the, the narratives we all are influenced by. And there's like, it's hard to pin it down, but our culture, it's what we'll call the American dream. We're all shaped by this consumerism, materialism, this self-individualistic focus, and uh, driven by competition and success, keeping up with the Joneses or the Kardashians. And this, this influences our, our, our habits, our thoughts, um, the way we buy things, the dreams we, we collect along the way of security and comfort, of ownership. Um, we just have to wake up in the morning, and these are narratives that are being advertised to us on our drive, on our commutes, in our social media streams, when we go online to buy something, when we watch TV, we're being influenced by narratives. Are you with me? These are stories we believe are narratives. They're shaping how we interact in the world, and they shape who we are. The second, um, on the bottom right of the triangle, this is how we are shaped, our habits. Habits shape us. All sorts of work has been done over the last few decades in the field of psychology to point out the power of a habit, the power of habits. We are little more than the cumulative effect of our daily and weekly habits. So what we do on a regular basis, we become. So the things we do, do something to us. For example, I didn't wake up one day and read a book about loving coffee. I didn't have to. The habit of drinking coffee in the morning develop this longing every morning for coffee and this love for coffee. Do you, do you get that, that one habit? Now think about all the million in unintended, unintentional habits that you have. The fact that we check our phone as often as you do, that we have phantom vibrations in our pockets. The fact that you have literal anxiety when you can't find your phone. I spent half of my time this week searching for my wife's phone, by the way. It's something that, because she loses it all the time. And she, she, and she forgets her iCloud password, so I can't find it through Find My. And 90% of the time, it is somewhere in her giant purse. <laughs> Habits, and that shapes me. <laughs> We're shaped by the habits we collect along the way. We'll get into that in a second. An intentional habit. The third on the bottom is relationships. So we're shaped by our relationships, the office, the people in our workplace, the, the people that we spend time with. Odds are you look like, you dress like, you talk like, you vote like your people, your relationships that your friends and your community that you have. And we'll talk about the difference between relationships and community in a second. This is a good and ba bad thing. We're shaped by the people we're around. It depends. Now, the question is, are you being shaped by people that look like Jesus or not? Are you being molded into those relationships? Or are you being a person who's transformed that's shaping and molding the relationships around you? Right? So you, we're, we all know this. Peer pressure is brutal. We do the things that um, uh, the people around us do unintentionally because there's a power and current influencing us. And this is why social media unchecked is so toxic. Would you agree with this? Like, you don't even have to know a person. You can just follow them and... And it shapes the contentment you might have in your life because they're posting these beautiful pictures of their travel. They don't work. They have like some type of independent wealth and they have three kids <laughs> that never cry. They're always dressed perfectly. They sleep, they have like, they have no sleep problems. <laughs> it's literally like there's, it, we're shaped by that. 
the fourth. This should be familiar. I'm just bringing awareness to the unintentional um, spiritual formation we have. The fourth is the environment we're around. The environment. And there's two environments that shape us. The first is our, our location. Long Beach or Southern California is a formation machine. We live in a place in the world that is unlike anywhere else in the world that has a very particular bent on what we are supposed to live like, look like, and be like. We're not to try hard. We literally step out and drive, and we are influenced by this powerful community Southern California is of shaping and forming us. That's one. So our environment shapes us, but also there's a second environment, and that's the first time in history we actually live in two places at once. There's a phone world, an internet world, that is an all, another environment that shapes us. So the physical environment that we live in, our culture, a physical place, shapes us, but there's also this other thing, the, the phone and social media and internet world that shapes us. And this is why I can be in small town Auburn, 45 minutes west of Sacramento, or east of Sacramento over the Thanksgiving holiday and walk into a new coffee shop that looks like it belongs in Silver Lake. It's the power, I mean, that's why our world in many ways is getting smaller. Hipsters look the same in every single city. <laughs> it, 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 they do, like, they're, because of the power of the, the world of the phone and social media. Like, you can literally go to any city and find this, like, amazing coffee with the people that look exactly the same, whether it's <laughs> London, Long Beach, L.A., Portland, like, somewhere in Ohio. Like, I'm sure, I don't know if Ohio has it, but maybe. Go yep. My dad's from Ohio, and he's here, so I'm just shout out to my dad. I'm sure they don't have hipsters in Ohio. No, they do. I'm sure they do. Um, so those are all the things that shape us. Relationships, the environment, our habits, our stories. All of this happens over a long period of time, and then um, through our experiences. So what shapes us? Well, when we go through divorce as a kid, or when um, we have a child, when we get married, um, we get married, then we have a child. We, whether we make lots of money or we go bankrupt, those experiences have an effect on us. Do you see how we are being shaped and formed unintentionally every day when we wake up in the morning, when we make our coffee, when we stream through our social media feeds, when we check our phones a million times a day, when we hang out with people that have powerful voices in our mind and reality that keep us, keep the narrative of the American dream alive. Un, unchecked, unintentional spiritual formation. That is a paradigm you need to understand that you are being shaped, you're being discipled by something or someone. You with me? Okay, so then the question is, if, that's, if all of that has an effect on us, and that's how you become more like your environment or more like the habits or the people in your office, how do we become more like Jesus? How then do we become more like Jesus? Now, before I answer that, I, wanna, I just want to beat up two myths real quick. The first is this. Uh, what change looked like in the past? All you need is to read the Bible more. You want to change your life? Just read the Bible. Anyone believe this growing up? Like the answer to the problems in your marriage is just read the Bible more. The answer to your depression is just meditate on rejoice in the Lord. And I'm beating this up on purpose. This comes from the Protestant Reformation. This comes from Enlightenment thinking. It comes from the worldview of Descartes philosophy. I think, therefore I am. And bless his heart, I love Luther. I love studying the, the robust revolution that Martin Luther brought with the Reformation, but it had some hiccups, some problems with it. Number one is that he, he really believes sanctification happened through preaching the gospel, through reading the Bible, and, and taking notes on Sundays through preaching, and discipleship was basically understanding right doctrine, reading right doctrine. Now that's an oversimplification. I'm sure I might be wrong, and, and one of my theologian friends can dis discredit that. Um, but this is my oversimplification because what I've seen is the problem is we all know and we've all been around Jesus-centered, gospel-preaching, Bible-teaching churches for decades and we haven't experienced transformation. Like we can read the Bible all the time and still be full of greed. Anyone want to just raise their hand? I'm like, okay. Right? Like, like we, could, we could meditate 
Like, this is my story. I can meditate and memorize, do not worry about your life, and be full of anxiety and have panic attacks. There's a disconnect between just, just read the Bible. There's nothing necessarily wrong with reading the Bible. I'm not be, we need to read the Bible. But we aren't, humans are not just thinking beings. We're not brains with legs on them, right? Um, and... <laughs> And we can't just think something and it become a reality because that's not what it means to be human at all. Um, and, and knowing something is not the same thing as doing something. And doing something and knowing something is not the same thing as wanting to do something. Right? Like, like I remember a perfect case in point. This is the perfect illustration. Whole, whole 30 diet last year. Uh, around this time, I was like, man, I need to shape my diet. I, was, I did a 45-day whole 30. I went, because I'm a performance-driven person. It's only 30 days. I went 15 days extra. <laughs> I had to prove my worthiness. But I remember reading about Whole30 while eating In-N-Out cheeseburger. <laughs> and fries. Two double-doubles and fries. That's how I roll. Re so do you see that? But that's the story of our life, is it not? We could be reading about Whole30 while consuming In-N-Out cheeseburgers. Because we're more than just what we think. And that means our, uh, for apprenticeship to Jesus, you can't think your way into Christ-likeness. That's myth number one. Myth number two, you don't have to do anything. It's all up to God. Now, if the first uh, myth we're talking about is probably more prevalent in Bible churches or Reformed churches, which we are a Bible church, this second one is more prevalent in Pentecostal charismatic churches, which were also charismatic. And it's this theology that you don't need to do anything with, uh, about your discipleship. You don't need to do anything to change. That's all up to God. It's the matrix theology. Anyone see the matrix? So uh, there's this great scene in the first matrix. The other two are okay, but the first one's amazing. Although, disclaimer, it's very violent, but it was... A, a movie that transformed cinema. I mean, it's, it's an amazing film. Uh, nobody's stoked about The Matrix anymore. Like, <laughs> like, what's wrong? Like, what's wrong with you people? Do you know that Star Wars is less than a month away from its opening? Right? Like, whew. okay, Jesus, help me. Um, so there's a scene where like Trinity and Neo are on top of the, they get to the top of this building and they see a B-12 helicopter and Neo goes, can you fly a helicopter? And she's like, not yet. Operator, can you give me the schematics and the information to fly a B-12 helicopter? Her eyes flutter, download, she gets in the helicopter, she's flying the B-12 helicopter. For so many of us, we think that that's what sanctification and spiritual formation with God looks like, right? I'm full of anger and rage. I just need to get zapped in the front row at the church. <laughs> now, I don't want to discredit this because actually I know I have been radically transformed by coming forward and getting radically healed by the presence of God. And the presence of God can do that. But if that is our form of spiritual formation, if our, if our expectation is transformation is only going to happen when we, we come to a service to experience this environment that's more holy than other environments, which that's a, that's a lie as well. Because Jesus is just as present in the kids' ministry set up and tear down as he is when we're in his static worship, right? Like, he's just as present as you drive to work. Like that is just as saturated with the kingdom and, and the presence of God as when we're, we're on ecstasy singing songs together. But if this is, this is the way we experience transformation, we'll never be fully transformed. And we'll get burned out eventually because that doesn't have a theology for suffering, right? Um, so, and and what, I, what we do is we, what we have to recognize is change or transformation is a joint effort between you and God. So I love what Dallas Willard says. Grace isn't opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. Grace isn't opposed to working hard or training hard, it's opposed to earning it. And we can't confuse the two. So um, we have to recognize that transformation is a partnership with God. Are you with me? So this leads me back to the question. Therefore, and this is the paradigm we're going to tease out over the next like six months, how do we change? How do we experience transformation? What does intentional spiritual formation look like? And starting in January, we're going to teach through each of these things. 
So in January, we'll frame the first four or five months of teaching around how we actually change in detail. But here's the quick overview. Is this helpful? Number one, we replace the stories we believe with teaching or better narratives. So teaching is the best, uh, the best teaching does more than just tell you right from wrong. It gets into your head, vision, and heart and presents to you the good life. It undermines the stories we believe, that we believe, the narratives we've inherited, and it says, actually, this is true, that's a lie. So biblical teaching, Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 1. And this is what teach, This is what we have to participate in. So this is why preaching is so important. This is why reading the Bible is so important. This is why podcasts, are important, and reading biblical truth is important because it plays a vital role in our transforma- transformation. We, we replace false narratives with true narratives. Like a couple of examples would be, for those of us like myself that grew up thinking we're not good enough, we have to challenge that view and replace that view with the truth that actually we're made in the image of God, that we are more than enough, that we, are, uh, that we begin in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 with being Commissioned, blessed by God as very good. Is that good? And Jesus says we're more than conquerors. We're saints. We're holy. We're set apart. We're, we're, uh, 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 we're adopted children. So all the identity that we carry that has been shaped by the world needs to be replaced with biblical teaching for us to operate in this world. Sexuality, the same way. We, the world and culture might say one thing about sexuality and sex, but the Bible has some other things to say right? Uh, uh, about marriage, about divorce, about uh, uh, our, our, our rights and liberties as Christians, as disciples. Like we, Paul says, you know, like um, uh, we're, we're free to do anything, but, but don't allow your freedom to cause your younger brother or your weaker brother to stumble. So Paul will regularly limit his freedoms for the sake of mission, Right? So that should shape, those, those, that teaching should shape us. And let's just beat up on the American dream just for one second. Is that okay? Because that keeps coming out on accident. Sorry about that. Um, but this is a big one because the church has married itself to the American dream. And, and if you look at scripture, what you see is, is a challenge to the cap Western view of finances and how we deal with money. So much of the American dream is pointed at your individualism that your private view of money, your private use of wealth for your own vacations, for your own homes, for your own dreams, for your own jobs, for your, in, your little tiny family. But when you actually look at the revolution of, the God, of all of the scriptures, of how money and possessions are designed to work for the people of God, when you look at Jesus' announcement of the Jubilee, uh, of the Lord, year of the Lord's favor, his, his constant attention to wealth and possessions, what you see is that money and possessions are tools for the common good. It was never designed for self-accumulation. It was designed for a, a people to be working together for the common good. I'm not talking about communism. I'm not talking about socialist view. I'm talking about the, the, the people of God were to rally together to make sure that the needs of the community were met. We're just supposed to share and extend, and, uh, extend our resources to those um, that don't have enough. And yeah, you're going to get taken advantage of. Yep, that's going to happen. But that's, that's the ethic that the scriptures teach. And that challenges. Does that not challenge? So we need to start asking questions. If we allow the scriptures to really get into our hearts, we start allowing the scriptures to challenge our use of money, our purchasing, our dreams, our vacations, all of those things, and making sure that we include our brothers and sisters. I was just having this conversation with my mother-in-law, which you know that could always go south, but it didn't go south. It actually was powerful. And she was like, man, I, we're in this position where we have more than we need and, and all of our needs for the future are met and we want to bless people. We just don't even know where to begin. It's like we're paralyzed by all the needs. And I said, don't even worry about all the needs. Why don't you just start with the relationships you do have? Like your mom is in debt. Why don't you just get her out of debt? Uh, your, your, your sister needs to, some help with credit card debt. Why don't you pay off that like... And, and it was just beautiful, like, revelation where she's like, I don't have to solve the world's problems. I just have to, I just have to serve my friends and family. And imagine, and then she's like, I just want to use 
the money I have to change people life, change people's lives. And I was like, that's exactly it. And so that's what we do, right? So that's just one way that we can challenge the narratives. Is that okay? Yeah. You can leave if you want. I, I totally get it. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Uh, number two is practice. So in the Sermon on the Mount, we've talked about this, and we'll do a whole teaching on this. It, the Sermon on the Mount begins and ends with putting this sermon into practice. We said it's not about trying really hard. It's about training really hard. And so what we see is Jesus assumed this way of life is going to take a lifetime of practice in community. I used the analogy of playing the drums in the first service a couple weeks ago, and then I used the analogy of playing the guitar. Um, You don't get good at playing the guitar overnight. You do it over a long period of time. It takes practice to get there, right? Are you with me? So anything, like following Jesus, like anything, it's formation. Uh, There is no formation without repetition. It's why we uh, need to practice the spiritual disciplines because practices um, or spiritual disciplines are key to transformation and change. Now, just pay attention for one second on this. Um, The things we do do something to us. And this is bad news for lots of reasons. It's bad news for me and coffee because coffee can do some damage to you over a long period of time like ulcers, if you're not careful, um, or any, un- like uh, checking your phone as often as we do can distract you and create uh, problems in your marriage. I'm sure some of you have already seen that. You're just staring at, at the end of the day at a blank at a screen and your spouse is over there laying down looking at a screen. That shapes your marriage. Um, but it's a good thing when we apply it to Jesus. It's good news for me and Jesus. Here's what happens. So when we practice the things that Jesus did, something very specific happens. Um, They get into our subconscious at like the limbic system level um, to what writers in the Bible call, they they begin to change our hearts, our longings, and our loves. So the practices of Jesus do more than just help you live a better life or get better at living right. They help you get better at loving right. And we'll talk about the disciplines in the next, uh, next year. So that's what practices, so challenging these Unintentional habits with healthy practices. So the third is community. So we move from relationships to community or covenantal community. Or we use the language shared loving family. And the diff- what's the difference between com- uh, relationships and community? Well, in relationships, we self-select based on preference. So you self-select relationships based on your preferences. This is why we changed the model of from garden groups to house churches, by the way. Because ha- garden groups were easy for us to, based on life stage, based on our personal preferences, to get in a, com- a group of people that were a lot like us. House churches and covenantal community, you don't get to select who's a part of that. This is why it's so profound to be church. That In fact, the more diverse, the better. Because our community with one another is not determined about, by our preferences. It's determined by those who follow Jesus and are covenanting around following Jesus together on the mission of Christ in our city or neighborhood alongside us. So this is so important for us. Like for house churches right now, we're like three months in. And my house church has a lot of people in the same life stage and then a bunch of people that aren't in the same life stage. And it would be very easy for those people in the different life stage to, to opt out of community because they're single and they're not married with kids. But the truth is, without the singles, without those that don't have kids, without the different ages, um, we will just become like this tiny little nit, uh, niche uh, clique. Uh, and, and that's not what the church is designed to be. It's designed to be unique. It's designed to be, um, sorry, uh, full of diversity. And, and that diversity, two things happen when, when you commit to a community. Two things happen over a long period of time. There's exposure and encouragement. Now, this is why community is so important. Jesus didn't just have a disciple. He had disciples because community is the context where change actually happens. And so we have two things that take place in, in a covenantal community. What you get is exposure, And what happens when you choose to commit and keep showing up to a house church community at the church, at the garden, um, you develop, or you have close friendships, or you're married, stuff, uh, you get exposed to who you really are, right? It's like a sponge being squeezed. You find out what's really in a person. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Like, single people, you think you're amazing and awesome until you get married, 
And then you realize, well, I'm really selfish and a jerk. <laughs> and it's not like after your wedding day you get worse. It's that before there was nobody to expose you to the tool shed that you really are. <laughs> it's true. The community brings out the best and worst in you. It's called exposure. It's over, over, like my wife will call me out all the time. It's the gift. It, like that's why marriage is seen as a sacrament. It's a divine grace. An invisible grace. A visible symbol of an invisible grace. So I have been sanctified through 10 years of marriage, for better or worse. And it's true, like because of this constant exposure where she, she sees the real me, She's able to expose the lies and the falsehoods. And the second thing that happens is there's encouragement where someone is able to see who you really are and bring that out of you. So the best communities are not just exposing the issues in your life. They are encouraging the person who you really are. And what house churches should do is prophetically speak to one another and draw out the best of us. Like, there's a guy in our house church, and my wife and I were noticing every time he shows up, he never comes empty-handed. We don't always have meals together, but he always, he brought Postmates bags. He brings, like, hot sauce. He brings, um, like, just, like, random stuff. But he, he, like, I'm moving our house, and he brings, like, bags full of, like, LaCroix and, like, waters and, and all sorts of stuff, Gatorades. It's like he never shows up empty-handed. And like the other day, I was like, man, I noticed this about you. This is a gift you have, and it's noticeable. And like, I know it impacted him, but like that's what we should do. We should draw out the encouragement and speak. Think about what happens in our society and culture. We try to cut each other down. Sarcasm is all we do. We just cut at each other. But Paul talks about the type of community that literally brings out the best is encouragement, thankfulness, prophetically speaking out the thing we see that God's doing in you that maybe you don't even have eyes to see, but the community is around you saying, this is who you are. I'm going to blow it, but I remember this story of this tribe in Africa who um, uh, the name of the person that was born, uh, the, they would, they, the mother would sing this song, and that would be the name for the child. And, and then when the, 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 they're giving birth, the mom's giving birth, and the whole tribe would come around and sing the song of this, this child, this name. And then they tell the story of whenever the child would do something wrong, they wouldn't shame the child, even if they were like, you know, 13-year-old kids. They would put the child in the center of the village, and the village would come around them and sing the name, reminding them who they are. This is what the community is designed to do, real covenantal community is to say, Darren, no, no, this is who you are. This is who you are. You're not this. This is who you are. We draw out the best. Are you with me? So uh, we need to expose each other and encourage each other. The uh, the fourth place is the middle. Rather than the environment shaping us, the Holy Spirit shapes us. So everything we talked about a couple weeks ago about abiding in the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit becomes the environment that uh, we breathe um, that it shapes us more than Southern California, more than our phones, more than social media. The Spirit becomes the baseline for all transformation. Um, and, and in the New Testament, this is the word grace, where God empowers deep transformation in our life uh, through His Spirit. The fifth, down, down below, is the same as unintentional. It's uh, time. Over a long period of time, we are shaped into Christ's likeness. So I, I just need to remind you that you can't microwave character You can't Amazon Prime character or transformation. There's no four-hour discipleship. Uh, This happens over a lifetime for eternity. And you you have to grow like a tree uh, to become more like Jesus. It will be inch by inch, but transformation will happen if you challenge this fast-paced world and choose to be intentional towards Christ-likeness over a long period of time. And anyone that struggles with addiction knows that that's what it looks like. Like when, you, when you're giving up alcohol, if you've been addicted to alcohol, it's, it's, it's not how many days at first. It's right now I'm sober. It's six hours. You stumble. It's to three hours. And that's the same for Christ-likeness, guys. Like it, is, it starts off with, okay, I'm, I'm experiencing more of his peace. And then you just take a couple steps back, but then you take a, step, a, cups, a st- couple steps forward. Are you with me? It happens over a long period of time. And then the last one, where we talked about experiences shaping up, what we have to recognize is that actually the hard knocks of life are 
radical places of real transformation. So as a disciple of Jesus, we know that life is not easy. And we know that uh, being a disciple of Jesus, most of the hard, difficult, gut-wrenching, painful things in life can become the catalyst to make you more like Jesus. In James chapter one, it says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind or many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So what we have to recognize it is that all throughout the scriptures, um, over and over again, the writers say that the worst of times of life, the times that we dread, the times that we avoid, the times that we're trying to just suffer through and get through, we can't wait to get out of, that's the place that we grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And in the U.S., We do everything we can to avoid or eliminate those hardships. Our nation is built on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Western Europe built an entire continent almost uh, around one city at a time becoming a godless utopia. But in the West, we don't know how to deal with suffering. We don't know how to deal with the cancer. We don't know how to deal with a loved one that has mental, mental illness. We don't know how to deal with unemployment, divorce, abuse, or pain. The best thing Western culture can provide is a distraction. So it's a drink, it's a meal, it's a show, it's a new car, it's a vacation in the sun. All we can do is hope the best. And if that doesn't work, we just hand you a pill, wish you the best. But what you have to recognize is that those painful experiences, the depression, the suffering, the spouse going through mental illness, the death, the cancer, the job loss, those can become the catalyst for Christ-likeness in your life. So personally, like when I look back and see uh, in 2015, I was like, around this time, I was reflecting, and I had become more anxious, I had become more depressed, I had become quick-tempered. Um, and I realized that for me, the transformation wasn't to, I was going to different therapists trying to resolve, like, resolve the conflict in my marriage and all these issues. I realized I had to eliminate certain habits to actually sit in the pain and disappointment in my life. So I've shared this openly, I fasted alcohol, and I started pursuing minimalism and simplicity. So what I start, and then I, I gave up social media for a long period of time. I gave up emails on my phone. I began to basically get rid of all the noise. And what I discovered under there was not a bunch of peace at first. It was all this pain, all this disappointment, all this shoving down those emotions because you just got to make everyone happy. And I allowed over a long period of time with community and my wife's involvement in fasting from those things uh, to just walk through those things slowly. And uh, now I look back two years ago, and I definitely have more peace. I definitely have the best marriage I've ever had in 10 years. I still have all sorts of anger. (laughs) I'm not perfect at all. I've made a couple of steps forward, and I've taken a couple of steps back, especially around the holidays. Um, Like I was just talking to Stan, who saw me on Sunday, last Sunday. I was trying to um, switch cars with my stepmom. I was driving up north on Monday morning, and I could not get her car car seat out of the car. I had to put Amos' car seat in. I could not get her car seat out. I literally lost my humanity for an hour and a half. (laughs) I was preaching about the revolution of Jesus in the morning. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I was, like, full of sin and anger. And I was was full of rage. I literally, like, lost it over a car seat. And I was like... I call her, I'm like, is there a secret to this? She's like, no secret. I'm, I'm about to cut her seatbelt off. Like, no joke. <laughs> we'll pay for it. About to like saw the car seat and buy a new car seat. And she calls, oh yeah, there's a, there's a button. You push it and then twist. And there was a secret. I just want you to know, like, I'm not perfect. Even on the drive up, like traffic hits in LA, of course. And my wife, my wife took a plane with Amos, and I had to drive, okay, just with a four-year-old, and, um, and she had to remind me, she's like, Darren, it's not the destination, this is part of Ezra's Thanksgiving experience, and like, because if you leave it to myself, I'm just going to be focused and ruin everything, but if it's for community to remind me, this is, this is the real story, it helped bring 
Transformation. So all to say, how do we experience transformation? It's all of this, right? It's through teaching, practice, community of the Holy Spirit over a long period of time through the hard knocks of life. Is transformation possible? Yes, really deep, soul-level transformation is possible, but it's not inevitable. It won't happen because you go to church or read your Bible or pray. And all of those things are really important, but those things in themselves will not push back against the tide of culture. They will carry you in the wrong direction. It is only possible if you're intentional about your apprenticeship to Jesus. So the question I want to leave you with, and this is, this is where we're landing. So we're going to get into details in January. We're going to go through each of these. And then we're going to talk about practices like fasting and prayer and Sabbath and all these things that shape us. Um, we'll do emotional health. I was just looking at it this week about what we're going to do because we need to disciple our emotions. We'll talk about all these things over the next year. Um, the question I leave you with is, who are you becoming? And I saw this post by Banksy. It's from Instagram. Here it is. Are you proud of who you have become? So 2015, I, I asked this question, who have I become? And I began to evaluate myself honestly, and I, cha- I, I was challenged by it. The question I want to leave you with, the question I want you to think about, create this week, just a little bit of space to think about, to reflect on, is who... Who are you becoming? And if, if you were to look 20, 30 years from now, the, the character arc of your life, are you becoming more like Jesus? Are you becoming more full of peace, more joy-filled, more generous, more kind, more embracing, more including, less offendable? I'm so easily offended. I literally read the worst in your emails. Like, it's like... It's so petty. I'm like a junior high girl. Like, it, like <laughs> what did she mean by that? Like, I'm literally like that. Or, or, or a junior high boy. Like, it's, it's not gender-based. Like, boys in the same way. <laughs> need, to, I need, to write, need to work on email etiquette. Um, so when you look at your life, 60, 70, 80. Some of you are already there. 90. Are you becoming more like Jesus in your life? And the answer to uh, the process of getting there is not just read or pray. The answer is that slide, intentional spiritual formation. The answer is challenging your, th- your thoughts and the stories and the narratives, challenging your unintentional habits with practices of Jesus, stepping into biblical covenantal community family, embracing the power of the Holy Spirit as the new environment from which you live over a long period of time, and then embracing the difficulties in life as the place for catalytic transformation. You with me? So I leave you with this. Think about who you are becoming Process it in community. So house churches, I just would love for you to just answer that question. Who are you becoming? Who do you want to become? What are the things that's going to help you along the way? How do you do this together? So house churches are going to probably bring this to the place where we work it out with our lives and hands. That's so important. Not just think about it, but practice it. Um, And the last thing I leave is I just want to encourage you. Anyone here and you're stuck and you think I can't change. You're addicted. Your relationships are dysfunctional. You're full of bitterness where that abuse from childhood had, has marked your present reality. You feel like you're still dealing with immaturity. You feel like you can't change. I want to tell you, you can change. You can experience transformation. Real metamorphosis. You can recover your humanity through apprenticeship to Jesus.